And now, before giving you the details of the battle, I bring you a warning. Every one of you listening to my voice, tell the world, tell this to everybody wherever they are. Watch the skies everywhere. Keep looking. Keep watching the skies. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Atomic Age Saucer Cast. My name is Jerry, and joining me is the Cinema Psyops man himself, Court Psyops. And by man, you mean the guy who does everything, absolutely. <laughs> yes, uh, the other guy just shows up and talks. Uh, Matt's funny, though. He has funny things to say, even though his uh, weird infatuation with Nazism is weird. We keep hearing <laughs> clips of that. That's always strange. He hates that I use that. Like He has basically tried to bargain that I remove that one clip when he was speaking as though the president was saying it <laughs> but he has learned he's learned that his pronoun troubles cause clips uh it's always good and joining us uh from the punk rock world the the psycho semantic man who runs a a very tight ship unlike people in the government we've got <laughs> darren wilson hey guys how are you doing Oh, I'm doing fucking fantastic now that I'm here with you two. <laughs> yes. And I'm doing much better now that I know that Jerry's doing well being around me. Who did that lizard yes? Uh, that, that was that was Darren. Yeah, that <laughs> was say, it was a fucking, do we have a reptilian on here? <laughs> oh, uh, shit. Yes, because Speaking of his of liberal reptilians. tendencies, he's reptilian. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, okay, guys. Uh, so this podcast... Hopes to shine light on the atomic age of cinema. That means films created between 1945 and 1965, as that is the birth of the atomic age uh, for the world. These films, while mostly B-movies, focus on two main things. The first is dealing with the effects of testing nuclear bombs. The fallout and radiation was on everyone's mind. Here we will see movies about it affecting animals and humans, making them grow to giant-sized behemoths, or defiguring us to the point where we lose humanity. The second is the Cold War, the fear of us being invaded by the enemy, and if we lose that war, these are represented by alien invasion movies, where we watch the skies in an ever-paranoid state, waiting for warning signs of what might be our destruction. In this show, we hope not to only examine these movies, but even look at the context of where these flicks show up, show us those fears uh, we had in the form of horror and science fiction we better know today as the sci-fi B-movies of the 50s. These movies speak in metaphors of science and military and above all else, the great human experience of a fearful future. And we are in that future, so welcome to that. So, uh, with that being said, I think you now get the gist of what we're going to do. So, before we get into our first movie review ever, we're going to kind of go and talk about ourselves in this genre. So, Court, where, where, how did you come about in this genre? Uh, mostly insomnia. I would blame pretty much TNT's show 100% Weird, who used to play a lot of these kind of obscure, hidden gem type old school sci-fi and horror fl films at like late, late at night. And 100% Weird could be on at any time. It was pretty much just a filler show that they threw on. I don't know if anybody remembers that out there or not. At one point in time, Penn and Teller hosted it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Weren't they like like security guards at a, like somewhere or something? Yeah, yeah, that was their shtick that they were doing when they were hosting it. But it was just basically whatever stuff that Turner had the rights to that he didn't colorize or, or what have you. I mean, that's how I saw Manster and a bunch of other flicks. And I do believe I caught Invisible Va Invaders on there at one point in time on this that show as well. But this is where I got a lot of this kind of influence of these kind of weirder things. Even uh, Ed Wood and Plan 9 from Outer Space, I think I caught on there. I think it aired at one point in time on 100% Weird. But it was just this show that basically like after two in the morning, they would start on TNT and they would run it until the infomercial time at like six in the morning or seven in the morning. So you would have a block of time where it could be anywhere from four to six movies, depending upon how long they were, that they would play this kind of weird stuff. And that's kind of how I really developed my love of it. And some of it comes from just extending from my love of classic horror. Whenever you start watching the Universal Monster movies at some point, they do start shifting over into the giant bug movies like uh, you, you would see like the Black Scorpion or uh, Tarantula or something along those lines. And it would just kind of like translate over and then you'd start seeing these Atomic Age Superman or like War of the Colossal Beast and that kind of stuff. And so it just kind of 
I don't know. I guess I kind of fell backwards into liking these kind of sci-fi movies, but I still became just as obsessed with them as what I was with horror at the time. Nice. Darren, how about yourself? I uh, I would say it's it, it was one of the genres that would often be put on TV at the house when I was growing up. My dad was a big fan. Uh, you know, batteries not included. Uh, although that might be more fan. I don't know. Anyway, uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 I got me interested in some, some sci- sci- sci-fi movies. And then in college, uh, <laughs> as... English majors often do. I took a wide variety of classes and, uh, you know, after I switched from journalism, but I took a lot of uh, about two or three sci-fi classes, uh, sci-fi literature and sci-fi film. And I was relatively unversed. I still am. But uh, taking those classes, having people that are really into the genre talk about stuff that they really like was a really good springboard for me. Nice. Uh, I followed the uh, court way where I mostly got into it from uh, television. Uh, so, like, a lot of times when Monster Vision wasn't showing, like, anything great, they would show these black and white B-movies, um, like the Cyclops. Um, and I, I just really got into it. Uh, obviously, uh, I do Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, and uh, the original Gojira greatly fits into this category. Um but I was also super into UFOs and aliens, so I liked all these uh, alien invasion movies. And I have a deep love of black and white horror movies that grew from the Universal Monsters. And uh, once you kind of start finishing through those movies in the 30s and 40s and you get to the 50s, you realize this huge change where like sci-fi becomes more into it because once the 50s hit, everything was becoming so much more advanced and science was this big thing because of the war and all the new ways we could find to kill people. Um, and from that, we got all these great movies. And, and like I said, in the intro, we will talk about how the cold war greatly affected this, how uh, radiation like was a constant thing. And it was always like, Oh, I can't wait to see what, how this monster gets radiated. Um, like, and this genre kind of died in the mid 60s with a few ones sticking out like um it became more it came different like you went from them to empire of the ants well in a lot of cases too the real death nail is night of the living dead and that swung everybody's interest in all of the kids that were crazy about these kinds of movies back into full-blown horror because it just blew all of their minds yeah plus with the 60s you had the rise of hammer and you had uh, the Vincent Price flicks happening, so there was that whole gothic renaissance that happened in the 60s that also kind of killed it. Uh, yeah. In the 70s, it kind of continued while we also started having the more gorier side, thanks to um, Night of the Living Dead and then, you know, William... Uh, not William Castle. Fucking William Castle was 50s, but uh, we had, like, uh, the Wizard of Gore and stuff like that that started focusing more on blood and less on the more because a lot of these movies actually kind of come out to be very political um kind of different in the political for these because most of these are actually kind of pro-government the government military save us while science got us into this mess which <laughs> i think yeah is they're, just they're right-wing fantasy movies really in a lot of cases <laughs> yeah but they they do kind of take you back to a more innocent time where we didn't know anything and everything was like kept secret and you didn't talk back about the government and stuff like that. Like, it's like, can you picture like Darren in the fifties trying to do the psycho semantic podcast? <laughs> no, he would be blacklisted in a subversive and we would never hear from him again. Yeah. He would disappear. You wouldn't have it over my shack on the one and only, or the second recording you just hear. <laughs> <laughs> And then we get the movie about yeah. the two-headed podcaster. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It was communist infiltration. Uh, Darren was a communist. He also uh, was pro-aliens invading us. He thought uh, that they would do a better job, and we had to take him out. He was an obvious uh, threat to the world. <laughs> uh, I could see it. Known to have been at Dalton Trumbo's house on at least two <laughs> occasions. 
<laughs> indulging in whatever ungodly acts Dalton Trumbo is all about. <laughs> he, he definitely uh, has been caught jacking off to literature by Lennon, so we definitely have to get him uh, put away fast. Yeah, that's B.I., not, you know, John. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not the, not, the, not the Beatles. This is more uh, a communist manifesto, so to speak. So uh, the movie we're doing today is Invisible Invaders from 1959, written by Samuel Newman and directed by Edward L. Kahn. Now, Edward L. Kahn, he, uh, he was uh, into this kind of stuff. He, he did a couple of horror movies. He did quite a, a lot of science fiction up until the 60s. Uh, keep in mind, he, he did like 120 fucking movies. Uh, and he kind of went through different genres. He did a lot in the forties and fifties. He was doing a lot of like, uh, noir stuff, which was actually pretty cool. Uh, but always kind of on the cheaper side. And eventually as the fifties went on, he started doing like zombie movies and voodoo movies and stuff like that. He did uh invasion of the saucer man. Ah, that's a great flick. <laughs> uh, yeah, he did, uh, it, the terror from beyond space, which the monster from that movie is in this movie interestingly enough uh in fact <laughs> there's this, a lot of things from other movies that got put into this movie <laughs> yes uh in fact uh this movie would come out on a double bill with another movie he did the four skulls of jonathan drake oh that's a freaking great old school horror flick yes so i mean uh and then after this he kind of went into doing a lot of westerns uh after invisible invaders he never really never really truly came back to the genre after that, like the last thing he ever did was like this really cheap Beauty and the Beast, uh, and then that was pretty much it. He he was done. I think uh, I think he died not long after that. And the guy who wrote this, Samuel Newman, uh, he wrote the Giant Claw. Wow, that is the ultimate in cheesiness right there, the Giant Claw. Yes, uh, he. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really get much much more than the giant claw he also did a bunch of bunch of westerns he actually mostly did westerns for like the beginning of his career if you go or that and he also did a lot of like the jungle movies like jungle Jim in the forbidden land uh voodoo tiger stuff like that it was it was a lot of jungle <laughs> stuff I, I think his most popular movie was jungle manhunt which is most I wonder popular if those movie are now is giant claw but still I wonder if those are like the Jungle Manhunt and stuff like that that he was in. I wonder if those are the types of movies that were uh, like the Tarzan knockoffs, but they couldn't get the rights to do Tarzan. So they would create various names, but it would basically be the same thing where it's a guy in like a leopard print onesie type wrestling outfit <laughs> hanging out in the jungle. They, there was a ton of those around this time. Uh, well, you are 100 percent correct. Uh, <laughs> that's it. that is what he did. Um yeah, he was kind of known for it. Uh, our, our main actors in this was uh, John Agar, uh, Gene Bryan, Philip Tong, um, who Philip Tong actually um, died. I, I believe it was he died right before the movie came out. Um, and then uh, Robert Hunt and John Carradine was in this for a little bit. Um, he played Dr. Carol Neumann, who Dr. Carol Neumann is also a name in The Giant Claw. Yeah, the writer oh. reuses stuff a lot, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, this whole movie is reused. Um, <laughs> it's it's proof that recycling can work. <laughs> yes, um, and we'll, we'll get into that and how we feel about it and how it works in this movie. But uh, this also this came out in 1959. Uh, the plot for this one off IMDb is aliens contacting science scientist Adam Pinner informs him that they have been on the moon for 20,000 years undetected due to their invisibility and have now decided to annihilate humanity unless all of the nations of earth surrender immediately um that's that's basically what it is and, and aliens coming down and uh possessing corpses is also used in another movie that came out in 1959 about three or four months after this movie came out the infamous plan nine from outer space by ed wood <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, the plot lines are so similar that it's uh, almost a little bit creepy. You wonder if Ed saw or heard about this movie and just stole that 
like just straight up, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I do, it's one of those weird things where movies kind of come out at the same time where they have like the same exact thing. Like, uh, not, but two or three years ago we had, uh, mayhem and, um, what was the other office one? Uh, the, oh, the Belko, Belko experiment, Belko yeah. experiment. And then also in the fifties, you had a three in trifecta of the blob coming out in America the Kaltiki monster coming out in Italy and the H man coming out in Japan and all three kind of go around this kind of blob substance as a monster. Well, and it, it might what just be a, called a oh, ahead. <laughs> I was going to say it might just be a zeitgeist of uh, the, the times that they're capturing for all of the films where that same idea just basically becomes something that is in the cultural mindset of an unstoppable thing that is just, you know, an eating force that comes from another realm to, to take care of us all. And the, the terror of aliens is basically, you know, in the mind of everyone just because of xenophobia and what's going to happen if the Russians make it over here and we don't realize it. I mean, that's yeah. the plot of like almost every sci-fi film. They just like exit communists and insert aliens. Yeah. And the one thing I like about uh, them making the uh, invaders invisible in this one is it kind of works in the sense that uh, back then, the Cold War was a, a very invisible war. The paranoia was everywhere because you really didn't know when they were going to happen. And there was constantly like people blending in and being, you know, communist spies. And they, they could be considered invisible as they went around and took information and plotted. Uh, so using the idea of invisible invaders for this, while um, a great way to save money on a budget... <laughs> uh actually does kind of work with when you think about how aliens in most of these movies are basically the metaphor for uh russia you only know them by their lack of being able to pick up their feet yeah <laughs> what you know what i this is kind of jumping ahead but how come uh the invisible invaders uh couldn't pick up their feet but when they took over the dead bodies the dead bodies could pick up their feet the dead bodies were used to our gravity, so they were able to manipulate them like um, mecha suits, but they themselves are not used to our gravity, regardless of how long they've been here, so it was harder for them to pick up their feet. That's my only excuse that I could come up with. <laughs> that does make sense, since you can, uh, everyone can slam dunk like uh, Michael Jordan on the moon. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. They're not used to Earth's gravity, but the human bodies are, and they're just refiring the ligature, the the lig the, the muscles and all that that's rigged inside of us to, to do what they needed to do. But yeah. the great owl from Secret of Nim was not specific in that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that was like when uh, it had been a while since I had seen anything with John Carradine in it uh, physically, and I just spent the first bit of him talking trying to remember why he kind of frightens me from my childhood and <laughs> that i saw he was the great owl in the secret of nim like all right you, you clearly haven't been watching enough flicks though because john carradine like cameos like a mother in everything around this era up until pretty much his death <laughs> yeah and he, he died in uh, 1988 yeah, yeah his and he, death was how i was born <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah so in this movie we we kind of have this uh great introduction of uh all this talk about the atomic bomb and the race for the atom supremacy which i really liked saying uh <laughs> i feel like that's the only time i can say supremacy is if i put adam in front of it <laughs> and only if it's spelled a-t-o-m otherwise you're just really into dudes named adam uh yeah i've got this real garden of eden fetish <laughs> uh trying to give him my apple you know what i'm saying uh so you like adam and his package uh yeah unfortunately uh my package is more like adam ant <laughs> uh small dick jokes everyone we're high class we're high class uh so this movie uh we find out that dr carol neumann died in a uh lab explosion he was doing atomic experiments and dr pinner who was a great friend of his uh, is telling a U.S. government agent that he is leaving his atomic research team. Uh, and he thinks that atomic research should only be continued if it's done for peace. Which I don't know why you're saying that to anyone in the government. <laughs> yeah, don't go all zero <laughs> Zalas on us yeah. now, dude. It's not going to help. 
I, I will at some point work in what happened to uh, Dr. Oppenheimer, who was involved in the Manhattan Project. Ooh, we will get to story time with Darren. Um, <laughs> so uh, we jump to the funeral and Penner is giving his speech. And uh, I love how it cuts to the invisible body. Uh, I, I said walking, but really shambling, shuffling even. Shuffling, yeah. yeah. Walking as if on ice. Yes, uh, every day he's shuffling. Uh, as he and the camera shot is kind of like from a waist down perspective, like uh, he's Elvis Presley, um, and it, you kind of see it for a second before it goes invisible, which uh, I always like. And then we get to uh, the the first really good part of the movie, uh, where Doctor Neumann shows up at Doctor Penner's house and tells him that the Earth pretty much has to surrender, or they're going to invade and take over Earth. Uh, by inhabiting dead people like he's doing it right now. He's inhabiting a dead earth man and causing chaos. And he also shows the uh, that they have the ability to turn things invisible. He shows this by having the Dr. Pinner hold a piece of uh, what his spaceship is made out of, which is tinfoil or things that uh, we saw at the Roswell crash. It was a rock covered in tinfoil. Let's be honest. That's what that was. Pretty much. Um, now... I really, really like how uh, Carrie Dean as Carol uh, keeps his eyes just f- blank, forever staring with no emotion while his mouth is speaking. The mouth is actually showing an expre- expression. Um, but th- the eyes just stay in this like forever just dumb blank stare. Yeah, it was yeah. really creepy. He really sells it a lot more than anybody else. Um, the idea of this, the dead walking around and being reanimated by aliens. And while it may be a similar plot line to what goes on in Plan 9 from Outer Space, instead of them being autonomous units, they're basically wearing us like meat sacks in this, which is so much more horrifying to think about. Yeah, it's so much sexier also. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's yeah, tomato, classy, tomato. like, because everyone gets buried in suits. Like, they actually have almost everybody in suits, like, all the zombies are wearing suits. I actually really like that. I thought that was a really clever touch. Because you yeah, don't some see of them... that in a lot of zombie movies. The the people who come up from the graves are never wearing, like, suits. And, you would, and you're and you kind of like, well, wouldn't they be buried in suits? Well, in all reality, the backs would be cut out and they'd be walking around naked once that fell off anyway. <laughs> Assless suits. Ugh. Ooh, I kind of uh, like what, that. What, was that in the 90s? 90- Night of the Living Dead remake, or was that yeah. in Zombieland? Yeah, no, both? they totally okay. they use that in the ninety Night of the Living Dead remake because that's actually what morticians would do. They cut away the clothes just so they didn't have to pick up the body, and they would just wrap the clothes around the body, assuming that no one would dump the body out of the casket, like in Pet Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> well, the chi- child you can kind of lift up and manhandle to put the clothes on, throw it around, <laughs> you know, like a like you're doing the spinny pizza dough thing. You can do that with Gage; he's tiny. Well, I will just refer to your knowledge of how to dress a dead child and not say anything from there. <laughs> okay. I will tell you as a person who tries to dress a living child every day, if they held still, it would probably be easier. <laughs> uh, I try to put things on my cat, and he doesn't like that. That's about the closest thing I got. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I was just thinking about, I really want to put my cat in a suit now. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Make um, it a punk vest with patches. I don't think he would like that either. Uh, he's not very fond of it. The kitten might. I might be able to put it on the kitten. She'll take it. She's a little fucking whore anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know... Pinner knows all this, and his daughter Phyllis shows up with uh, Dr. John who is, as we will find out, the biggest bitch in history. (laughs) Uh, But right now, he's still a respectable human being. Um, So, they tell... Pinner basically now explains the ridiculous idea that uh, invisible aliens are going to come and take over dead bodies of human Earthmen and destroy the world. And he wants him to tell that to the fucking government. Because he can't do it because he just did all this peace talk. So he's already on a communist watch list. (laughs) 
much like yeah because anytime you anytime you talk peace you're automatically a communist yeah exactly um so of course no one believes that shit absolutely no one so uh we go we go and uh pinner and the gang they go up to the cemetery which uh the grave now has more dirt on top of it than it did before and the flowers are arranged differently which makes me think did they are the aliens digging up the bodies and then like recovering it up to hide their tracks or do they have a way to like lift the body out of the dirt magically because i could see that you know causing more dirt to like pack up top or something I, it's really not clear you would think that they would just use the unburied dead because i mean that's the easiest thing to reanimate and jump back into or yeah, at least where the, do you keep all your unburied dead in a mortuary or a morgue a mortuary usually or so a morgue. Uh-huh. yeah not your would... backyard or basement no okay I'm gonna no, that's, that. that's phase two no oh, okay. no the buried dead I keep in my backyard and basement, Jerry. That's where all my burying takes place. <laughs> oh, I don't bury him. I just put him on the swing set and put, like, glasses on him and a hat. Well, eventually you got to get rid of the body. You can't leave the evidence around. Oh, you can last through fucking all of, like, October and halfway through November. <laughs> so if you, ta- you take down your goddamn Halloween decorations, Jerry? Uh, yes, no, yes. I just no. put Santa hats on them, and now they're Christmas decorations. I have done that with actual Halloween decorations where I put little Santa hats on them. It's the way to go. I want to find little Santa hats for like all my Jason Voorhees toys. (laughs) It's Christmassy now. It's a Christmas campfire, guys. Um, So, yeah, the uh, invisible people show up again and they basically were like, well, you didn't do it. You fucked up. You're going to have a warning coming. They're like, "Okay." So if you're going to warn the world about invading them and destroying them and subjecting them to your rule. What's the first thing you're going to want to do? Crash interrupt. a military plane? No, Sounds you interrupt like... a hockey game. <laughs> no, well, well, you know, but first you got to get the dead body. So you might as well crash the military plane. So, like, it's a military person that's going to be saying this. Then you take them to a hockey game, which... Did a lot of people in the 50s watch hockey? I didn't even know hockey existed back then. I thought that was like maybe a Canadian only thing at that point. And do you notice they didn't have helmets? <laughs> oh, uh, you didn't have you weren't required to wear a helmet until the 80s, I think. Oh wow, that's crazy. No wonder they it, were all missing a bunch it, of teeth back then. Yeah, especially like uh you get grandfathered into old rules. Like right now all people have to wear those eye protections. But if you started playing at a certain time before the rule existed, you can just say, you know, fuck you. I, I don't care. If so, like, <laughs> a guy shows up wearing a helmet in the 50s and is like, oh, look at David. What a fucking pussy. <laughs> yeah, it it really was um, it not was a that lawless funny. age back then in hockey. It was a lawless yeah. age back then in general. <laughs> uh so yeah, the the 1979. Corpse... Sorry, 1979 was when you had to start wearing a helmet. Oh, that's basically <laughs> the 80s. All new players starting 1979. Oh my gosh, so it was like half of them wearing helmets and half of them aren't. And there's some guy going, "Back in my day, we didn't have to wear fucking helmets like these <laughs> young fucking uh, 1970s millennial pussies." <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So the. Uh, the dead corpse of the fighter pilot, who looks really good for an explosion that big. I don't know if he jumped out first or how they even got the airplane to crash or, or any of that. They don't explain any of that. Um, fun fact, that footage is taken from a remote-controlled airplane uh, that the government was running experiments on, and it crashed. I was going to say, if not, if that was really mean of the aliens to put that giant white X on the mountain and then crash the plane. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, they funny had to enough, have a target for him to hit. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's how the store Target was born, actually. So, <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah. Uh, and I think the reason that the actor is in such good shape or the zombie that the actor is playing is in such good shape is because the crash was so violent, it threw him from the stock footage. <laughs> oh, probably. Also, he's made of, like, 
1940s mother's milk. He's like hardcore. He survived fucking a world war. He he's he's not like us nowadays. I can't survive <laughs> without Facebook for an hour. <laughs> you know? Uh so he shows up at a hockey match and he completely chokes out and kills one guy and then just makes the other guy pass out before he gives his message of, hey, we're going to come and invade all y'all and fuck all y'all up, so y'all better surrender. And, and then, he, you know, the Invisible Man leaves the corpse there because he's a fucking litter bug. <laughs> yeah, single-use corpses are not good for the environment. It really is not. Uh, I don't even like single-use friends. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, when that doesn't really work, they, uh, decide to do it again. And this time they make a really nice car flip over and crash. And that guy actually looks in better condition than the airplane guy. Um, He was also thrown from the stock footage of the Thunder Road ending crash. That's the ending crash of the movie Thunder Road, which was a Robert Mitchum vehicle. Yes, it was. That was also, uh, I get it, vehicle, because it was a car in a movie. (laughs) Uh, Yes, and he was the driver of said vehicle of Thunder Road. Uh, Also the singer of the theme song. Oh, really? Mm, That's sexy. Um, He goes to another sporting event to inform everyone, and this time everyone kind of takes it serious because it's not fucking hockey. Uh, (laughs) Ouch, harsh sauce. Uh, it's the 1950s, I, and I live in Nashville where hockey is fucking huge. Yeah, go, uh, well, I don't want to say go Preds because they are c- competitors to my Blue Jackets. Uh, Let's just cheer hockey. Go hockey. Oh, yeah. I, I, go I hockey. Time out. Like, when people choose sports teams, do they never go Blue Jacket? That doesn't. Even, that sounds like an Elvis song, not a fucking hockey team. Why would I vote for that team? Oh, because Ohio gave more soldiers to the Union Army in the Civil War than any other state in the Union. So Hence the name Blue Jacket. Blue Jackets. Which is okay, definitely well, something Darren can get behind. That's why they fire a cannon and play For Those About to Rock by ACDC every time uh, they score a goal. Do they, or is it just that cheap to continue to play ACDC? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're just trying to sober up all the drunk people with bad music. Yeah, you scare a lot of people. It's fun. It's fun at home games to see people <laughs> I should not talk about seats underneath the cannon. I, I like should not talk about sports. I literally know nothing, but you know, Predators is still a, a much better team because you know, we don't you don't know what kind of predators we are. Are we going for your fucking dogs, your children, your wives? You don't know. Yeah. Saber tooth tigers eat a lot of things. They do. They will eat the shit out of cavemen. I've seen it in cartoons. <laughs> Unless uh, it's Fred Flintstone's saber tooth tiger, and then uh, he he puts it out, and it locks him out of the house, right? <laughs> well, that's a dino. That's Dino. Oh, I and, thought it was... Okay. And, no, Dino was the dog, but he did have a saber tooth tiger cat in the intro and outro. In the outro, the cat gets thrown out and then jumps in the window and then kicks Fred out and locks him out for the night. He screams and, Wilma, and that's yeah. the end of it. <laughs> tangents. Tangent complete. Tangent Meet complete. the tangents. <laughs> oh, that's, that's pretty funny. So, uh... At this point, we get uh, some of my favorite things in this movie. Stock footage of fire and destruction and riots and all those good times with uh, just narration, like a documentary. Just We automatically just go out of the movie and into a documentary of what's really going on, which is great. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, but... Uh, the spinning newspapers that's done earlier when everyone's calling Dr. Pinner a quack is fantastic with the best one being first look at invisible invaders. And it's like just, oh, it's just blank. Big blank page. It was so fucking good. But uh, we get all this stock footage in this movie has tons of stock footage. So let's get into this. How do y'all feel about the stock footage? Like me personally, I actually kind of like it. It doesn't it feels like it's almost the exact exact same kind of film grade as the movie. So it doesn't like fully take me out with the narration going over it. It does kind of feel like I'm watching news reels. Like I could be watching what they're watching on TV. And so it actually really works for me in this movie. Uh, court, how does it work for you? When the guy's narrating over stock footage to kind of tell you the story, I'm fine with that. That's just a technique that they've used in this era. 
it's almost specifically in the 45 to 65 that you see that primarily. Um, when it's done badly, it really just destroys the story and really has like basically basically makes it hilarious to you. Uh, and you know, it's just because it's bad and they're just basically describing everything that happens on screen. There's a couple times they do that over actual footage where you can just see they just did that to move the plot along, I guess. And that's when it bugs me. But over the stock footage, it works. And I mean, the the worst uh, purveyor of this would be Ed Wood. And I keep coming back to that. But like this films are so similar. I mean, Plan 9 was built almost entirely out of stock footage for the most part. And a lot of other Ed Wood films were built the same way. But when he would do a narration to try and tell you what the stock footage was supposed to represent, it made absolutely no sense. Where with these guys, they're grabbing stock footage and they're showing you how the world is being turned into chaos with the aliens. So they're explaining that this was their first attack and this bridge that falls over is not just normal demolition. This was the aliens doing it, you know, and you get the story slowly brought out. But the parts that the overdubbed voice stuff does not work for me and is super annoying is like when they're building the sciencey stuff in the lab and you can see what it is that they're doing and it's very clear what they're doing and then the voiceover tells you that that's what they're doing. And it's like, you can fucking see it. Why are you telling me this? Yeah, it doesn't work there because there it doesn't feel like I'm watching a, a, a news story. It's it's yeah. you just fucking telling me. And I, I, I do agree. They should have taken that out and just left it over the stock footage because then it feels like I'm watching a news story on TV. It, it makes fucking sense. Uh, Darren, how did you feel about it? I relatively feel the same way. The the telling me what I already know part was unnecessary, but the rest of it, it felt more like, yeah, I could have been popping this in as a government propaganda film about how we defeated the the unseen enemy. But, yeah, when it's like, here, they're in the lab. It's like, yeah, I get it. You could pro- probably listen to this without watching it some of the, some of the time without missing anything because of Good. the way they... A good portion of it would make a good radio play, yeah. I actually feel like, I kind of wonder if George Romero saw this uh, movie when he was uh, younger, because the uh, news reports over the Living Dead attacking people does kind of seem like an Atomic Age version of Night of the Living Dead. Uh, Like, because in Night of the Living Dead, you get to hear the news reports over the radio constantly. And it's really good. I remember listening to the this dumb podcast, Cinema PsyOps. They did this <laughs> retrospective on the fucking series, and they kept playing. Uh, they don't actually like to talk that much on the podcast, so they just play clips <laughs> of of it instead. Uh, so yeah, I'm it makes their life this, easier. Yeah, so I'm listening to this great radio uh, you know, broadcast that's happening in Night of the Living Dead where it's telling you all these news reports, and it does – and in that one, it works great because it's not someone narrating. It's them, like, fixing up the house while we're hearing about all these news reports or it goes, like, the beginning of a scene right before they start talking. Um, it works really well, and it kind of – it did, I really did kind of, like, start thinking of Night of the Living Dead while I was watching this movie during this whole big stock footage scene. Well, Romero was uh, 18 or 19 when this came out. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these types of films, because there's this is not the only one that features the voiceover and stock footage to do this. And I mentioned Ed Wood because he's just the one that most people like really kind of get on for doing that. But tons of these kinds of sci-fi movies would put a bunch of stuff together to pad out the film to make it an hour long running length time. And they would do the voiceover almost news narration. So I, I would say that that was probably in the cultural mindset whenever Romero and Russo were writing the script, but those guys also worked in the news field. I mean, they went out and would shoot footage for news reels to be used. So, I mean, they were around the broadcast areas of like radio and TV and all of that kind of stuff in that, in their own specific era. So that probably influenced it even more to make it more realistic, but it's definitely a device that's been around for quite a while. Yeah. I think the reason I connected it, Watching this is because they are talking about, you know, cities, you know, going down because of zombies. Yeah, that the invisible invaders don't have any weapons of their own. They're just using what man has. Their biggest weapon is that they're invisible and can invade a body that has since deceased. Yeah, and talk about the greatest fucking analogy for for the Cold War ever. It's... Invisible invaders using us against us. It's basically our government 
you know, scaring us with this boogeyman of Russia, which we don't, us as regular Americans in the 50s would not see. Uh, I can speak of it because I was alive in the 50s. Uh, we never saw it. Uh, so it was like we were kind of using our, building our own propaganda paranoia machine to hurt us. And it, in reality, the enemy's invisible. We don't fucking see them. Uh, I mean, it goes as far as when they finally started making movies where we were getting invaded by, uh, like, the movie Red Dawn, where we can throw the fucking, you know, aliens out of it and just be like, fuck it, it's Russia. <laughs> or North Korea. <laughs> or North Korea. Yeah. Oh, how times have changed since the 50s where we don't have to be afraid of communist countries like China or Russia or North Korea anymore. <laughs> that's no longer a problem for us, thankfully. <laughs> I don't know how accurate that is. I feel like it's still a problem. My Chinese Whoa. came cold the other day, and I was very upset. <laughs> I blamed communism. Well, let, we could do a brief timeline, uh, if you like. Break it down. Break, well, we will Before <clears throat> we get into uh, the military and science joining to save us in this movie, we're going to have our story time with Darren. All right, so uh, does everybody remember when uh, World War II started? Yep, I, was I mean, going. yeah, it was, yeah, it was like I was just there. So okay, so 1939, 1938, a fella named Otto Hahn discovered nuclear fission in Germany. Way to go, asshole! Uh, that that got some people nervous. Um, in 1942, uh, FDR approved what would eventually become the Manhattan Project. August 6th, 1945, Hiroshima. August 1949, the Soviets dis uh, detonated a nuclear bomb that was the exact replica of the types of bombs that were used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, part of that was... I, this this is back when everybody started surprising each other with shit because uh, in World War II, Russia, who lost 27 million people fighting for the Allies in World War II, were very much surprised when their friend America detonated a nuclear bomb without sharing any, any sort of information. Uh, as it turns out, the way that they got the thing from the Manhattan Project was a guy called Klaus Fuchs who was connected to uh, the Rosenbergs. In 1950, the Rosenbergs were arrested. In, 1990, or in 1953, they were both executed at Sing Sing. Stuff that was declassified in 1994 showed that uh, Julius Rosenberg was almost definitely a Russian spy. He had a bunch of really cool code names, like Antenna and shit like that. Uh <laughs> His wife was just called Ethel. So she was probably not involved at all, or she was at least seen as not being important enough to be given a code name. I don't know. Ethel is, you know, like when I think of Ethel, I think of Friday the 13th part five and she had a mouth <laughs> on her. I feel like she was, she was definitely doing some, <laughs> some spying. Oh, I'm making my stew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you shut the fuck up? Um, so, but there were papers that America had at the time that would have almost definitely proven Julius to be a spy and Ethel to not really be a spy. But that wasn't declassified until uh, 1994. That also contained things that showed uh, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, who was involved in the Manhattan Project, we brought we brought him up earlier. He was like, "Holy fuck, let's not do this anymore." Um, but another guy in the in the department called Edward Teller wanted to develop the hydrogen bomb and wanted to make as many hydrogen bombs as possible. But Oppenheimer was against that. So Teller and a guy that has a uh, was in charge of the nuclear department in uh, the Department of Energy. 
they sort of accused Oppenheimer of being a communist, as you did to everybody you didn't like back then. Uh, there were all Senator McCarthy. Yeah. Uh, so he was stripped of all his clearance. He demanded a hearing, which sort of turned into a trial. His lawyers were sent out of the courtroom when classified information was presented. And uh, in 1994 and in 2014, stuff came out that pretty much showed that Oppenheimer was in no way really involved in communism. He, he knew people that were parts of the Communist Party, but he himself would have been cleared. But letting those documents be shown then would have let the Soviets know that America had cracked a code. And that's how they were getting it. That's how they knew about the Rosenbergs. There's uh, Oppenheimer. In um, 1950, America had 50 nuclear weapons. By 1960, and this movie came out in 1959, America had 1,200 yeah, you gotta you gotta get more. It's like <laughs> you like in nineteen you know eighty McDonald's didn't have a twenty piece chicken nugget, but now they do. That's that's America, <laughs> America. So yeah, in nineteen fifty nine, this also was not declassified until Bill Clinton did when he did the apology for eighteen people being injected with plutonium without their knowledge or their consent in the fifties while they were testing out stuff. Uh, he declassified about a thousand documents. And that also had the Strategic Air Command Atomic Weapons Requirement Study for 1959. And that was basically the 800 uh, page plan of how America would use the nuclear weapons if provoked, which is a vague term. But it's. <laughs> yeah, if it's, they don't tweet <laughs> the right thing, they're provoked. Yeah. Don't it was, at me. <laughs> it was launched all of them at the same time and take out China and Eastern Europe and then just fit later. But it was, uh, you know, 12, 1200 nuclear weapons. This specifically mentioned targets for at least 1100 of them. And, um, anybody terrified yet? Yeah. So, and all these things that I said, I, uh, double checked with the Smithsonian, like information the Smithsonian has available. So, you ever think the government at the time was like watching these movies and going, Fuck, I think they know something? <laughs> well, that's why a lot of Hollywood got blacklisted, obviously. Yeah, like Russia was just importing these movies to figure out what the government was doing. <laughs> yeah, did you, did you get the invisible invaders? We must watch, we will know, <laughs> comrade. I don't forget to watch. Accent. Forget to watching skies. Invisible invaders must watch. <laughs> did you get? Did you get the film reel? Is it a it, good thirty-five millimeter print? It only. It only hours seven minutes. Why can you not import? <laughs> I take sixteen millimeter print. It's fine. <laughs> okay, we send in about a month. <laughs> Ooh. Somehow Russia got Plan Nine from outer space instead. Which is the only reason we won the Cold War. Yeah, pretty much. They, they were just like, oh, these guys are fucking idiots. Let's just drop this shit. You can't beat up a retarded child. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Russia has no problem with that. No, they don't. I guess they don't. That's, that's a good point. Um, so, yeah, now that we're all smarter because of Darren and dumber because of me and Court. Um, yeah. <laughs> the army shows up with uh, our... Nice, slack-jawed Major Bruce J. Mm. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> John Edgar is not slack-jawed. <laughs> what do you mean he's not slack-jawed? It's, he's military. He's slack-jawed. Oh, well, military, yes, but the actor himself is just a gorgeous, wonderful man. John Edgar rules. <laughs> you don't think slack-jawed means... Be I think it means tough. Like, if you punch them in their chin, you break your knuckle. I always thought of it as they were like, you know, big dumb galoot kind of thing. Well, yeah, now, but in the 50s, it was all <laughs> about it. What are you talking about, man? That was sexy. Well, let's just focus in on what we do agree with, that John Agar is one beautiful slab of man meat. Oh, yeah, he was great. And you know what? Okay. Hey, I what really are, you, like... are you with this nerdy scientist? No, we're friends. I'm glad I asked. 
<laughs> you know what? <laughs> So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> I, I kind of like how they, they make him almost seem like a jerk, but then they turn around. So, like, our first introduction, we get him. They're driving, and uh, a guy comes out to try to hijack the Jeep. And uh, the Invisible Invaders show up for no fucking apparent reason, I guess. I, they tend to show up right when someone's about to die. Like, they know about it. Um, and... Uh, Jay ends up shooting the old countryman who tries to jack the Jeep with a shotgun. Uh, he shoots the civilian. And, um, you know, Phyllis is like, you killed him. And the army man's like, yeah, and you got answers the country needs. And I'm getting back of the Jeep. You know, so you're kind of like, oh, man, this guy sucks. He's just like, I mean, nowadays, you're like, this guy sucks. Back in the 50s, you were like, fuck yeah, America. <laughs> yeah it's really weird how the idea of what a hero can and cannot do has changed he's more of like what you would consider an anti-hero nowadays because he just needs to get this job done and if he doesn't save the world from the aliens there's no point in trying to be civil and polite for everybody anyway because they'll all be dead so he's just got to do what he's got to do yeah so like okay so they show up uh to their little uh underground army base military base uh and that's where they start finding out all these uh things like oh they don't have any weapons because of our atmosphere they only use us and our weapons they and they believe there may be a link to that and their molecular structure and here we find out that jay is very interested in phyllis and uh they have this really good conversation about making choices and this is kind of where like the civilian phyllis convinces anyone who was like I guess now convinces all of us that we need to get on Jay's side because, you know, what he's doing, he's doing to save the world. Back then, this was literally just basically saying, uh, science is for nerds. I want the military, man. He's the best. Right? Does everyone feel like, like how this movie was taken back then versus how it's taken now? Those are the two differences in how it's taken in that conversation. Well, I mean, it's John Agar, so anything that he says goes. Yeah, but, like, you, I, I understand you have a hard-on, but at the same time, your mind's kind of like, oh, but he's, you know, part of the military. Well, yeah, I have an issue with the military-industrial complex, but you send John Agar at me in a uniform, I'm going to feel just fine about it then. That's how we get we get uh, Court to, like, become a right wing. We just have him. John Hagar comes up and is like, Court, you're going to join the NRA. Yeah, I mean, you got to just approach me with the right kind of attitude, and John Agar's all about the right kind of attitude. Like, oh, yeah, sure, yeah. you want to go to the rifle range? Yeah, oh, oh, okay, I'll make sandwiches. Fucking <laughs> Darren shows up and fucking shoots uh, John Hagar like fucking he's the American sniper dude. <laughs> oh, wow, <laughs> that got dark real fast. Oh, God, I, 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 I kicked the court away, John Hagar, how dare you? <laughs> I kid, John Hagar didn't lie about a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. There so is. they they get this idea to use an acrylic liquid plastic spray gun that they plan to use it to spray a zombie, trapping the invader in the body as they believe it enters through the pores. Where they got this, I had no idea how it entered. I didn't know if it did it through the mouth cavity, the anal cavity, uh, through the eyes because the eyes are the soul to the mirror. Like I didn't know how they were doing it, but sure, pores. I think it was the idea of their molecular structure is um, unstable because of them making all the changes that make them invisible. So they sort of phase in and out, but they have to go through our pores to be able to do it is, I guess. But I think I, they just wanted an excuse to be able to trap one so they could further the plot. So they just went that route. There's bigger holes to go in is my point. Well, yeah, but multiple access points are much better than one large one. I mean, you say that, but that's not how I like my hookers. <laughs> um, well, it's all in preference, Jerry. It's all in preference. That's true. And here we also find, like, the first instance of John is a bitch. Dr. John is like, uh, Phyllis, they have no right to put you in such danger. And now, and now Phyllis, she's all on fucking Dr. on uh, fucking Jay's dick. So she's all like, haven't they, John? Doesn't the military and the government have the right to do whatever they need to do to keep us safe? Yes, yeah. yes, they do, including infringing upon your civil rights. You go, Janice, you go. Yeah, <laughs> god damn it. Uh, so uh, 
they outfit him with the super soaker and uh major j leaves the bunker and tries to capture a zombie um he's in a suit that's supposed to keep out radiation but like they don't even tuck like the thing that's supposed to like go into the neck hole down like it's just flapping around all willy-nilly uh, yeah, I don't know how well that would protect him in a radiation sequence other than it just looks cool. Of course, they also claim that truck beds, uh, I'm sorry, the cab of the truck also protects against radioactivity because, I don't know, it doesn't have an air conditioner system or something. Well, I mean, uh, the the radiation suits in Back to the Future even just looked like wind windbreaker onesies. <laughs> Basically. That's <laughs> With true. A, <laughs> So uh, he, he sprayed the zombie, but it wasn't enough to, to, for it to work. And the invisible invader got up and, like, knocked him out, but then he ran away like a little bitch. Kind of like his name was John. Because uh, he goes back into the body, and the body just gets up and walks away and doesn't finish the fucking job. Uh, these aliens are slackers. It's not how America would have done it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they, they rescue him. They find out the spray gun didn't work. It's just not fast enough. But the theory works. We know that's what counts. Yeah, because the guy got all panicked. The invisible Vader got all panicked and jumped out the front of the body when the back got sprayed. And yeah, then, much. And then attacked him. <laughs> I love their right. go-to move is to choke a bitch out. That's like their whole thing. They're just going to choke you down. Yeah, like they cannot do anything like real violently. So it's it's just always just choke. Um, it's not like the brain that... Or it wasn't, what's that movie where the brains are, like, floating around, and then at the end of the movie, they start, like, chopping the brains with a fucking axe. It's a black-and-white movie. Have y'all seen that one? Oh, yeah. Um, God uh, damn it. <laughs> I, I don't remember what it's called um, currently, but, uh, fuck, man, that movie's fucking fantastic. Um, <laughs> so this time, they decide to dig a hole and fill it li- with the liquid and just put a noose inside the liquid. Um, I mean, the guy's already dead, so if they hang him, it's no big deal. Well, you know, it's just amazing that when it fell into the barely covered hole of white goo, it landed its head or, like, well, I guess it was his head, right into the noose. It was out, it actually got to his midsection, so it probably went and jumped when it fell in. The, the noose should have been around the outside edge of it when they stretched it out or what have you, and then it pulled up through the midsection and then captured the guy. But what's more important is that not all of the acrylic hardened, just the stuff that hit the body hardened around him, the rest of it remained liquid, which I don't think that's how acrylic dries. Maybe I'm wrong on that, but that hasn't been my experience for acrylic. Ah, fuck it. You explained how the noose worked. I say we'll give it We'll give it to him <laughs> for, for the other one. Um, well, that's how nooses have always worked whenever I put them in a pit anyway. <laughs> Yeah, great. Darren sent us a picture of the fucking uh, brain, but that's not the brain. That's not like that one? No, okay. it's literally like a human brain with like the spinal cord in it. It kind of uses the spinal cord to like move. And towards the end of the movie, like it's like the bloodiest fucking movie before Night of the Living Dead. Like they axe the shit out of them and blood starts going everywhere. Like most of the movie, the brains are invisible. Hmm. I'm sure if someone Googles Invisible Brain Movie 1950s, it'll come up. <laughs> someone um, might give that a try while you continue. Oh, someone should do that. So um, they they caught themselves a plastic man. Uh, also, I guess they used every single giant fucking canister of that stuff in that one hole because all of those cans are gone. Um, yeah, that was a lot of acrylic that could have been winterizing ships and stuff. Yeah, also could have been used for all the other fucking ones that they had to fucking, you know, maybe kill. Good thing that stuff doesn't work. So they put the Plastic Man in a chamber and use pressure to crack it open. Also, John is a little bitch. <laughs> uh, so the plastic cracks and uh, they caught themselves an evader. So it leaves the body, sits in a chair and talks to them through a radio. It tells them that they cannot turn... Uh, them visible and that the leaders are considering surrender which uh you know i'm sure some countries were considering surrender but i doubt anyone had you know told the fucking aliens well i mean the minute anyone shows up france surrenders so i'm pretty sure that they had been trying to surrender all along 
Yeah, you know what's weird about the French? Like, okay, the country is started by the Franks, okay? Great warriors, they fucking dominate, okay? Uh, then after that, they get Napoleon, uh, they get Joan of Arc, and then everyone after that's a pussy. It's like, well, Napoleon got sent to an island to die, and Joan of Arc got burned in a, at a fucking stake. There is literally no reason for us to do anything anything badass ever again when it comes to military we are putting all of our stakes uh all of our effort into making uh extreme movies um and one day the country of france will apologize for fucking uh i stand alone that fucking duncan made me watch (laughs) this will come out before the episode of uh the podcast under the stairs top 10 uh 90s summer series which we are all three a part of and uh court reluctantly was a part of (laughs) i basically like offered to suck his dick to just let me like hang out there um i regretted it as soon as i had to watch i stand alone uh it's by the same guy who eventually did um like that climax movie that came out like last year and he's like one of the big guys in french extreme i think he did like inside um no, I um, I stand alone. Is um, is that Noé Gaspar Noé who also yeah, did? Yeah, that dude. Yeah, yeah. Fuck that movie. It is literally <laughs> just like it's a French guy sounding like a southern white guy in America. Like <laughs> it's the French version of a magma hat. That's what I'm saying. And I had to watch that movie. And I'm very upset. Uh, Fiend Without a Face. Court found our movie. Fiend Without a Face is uh, the movie from 1958 where you get to see brains get fucking axed. Yeah, and the one that uh, Darren found the photo was from um, the brain from Planet Eros, which was another floating around brain. Coincidentally, both of those films were huge influences on the floating uh, brains in Futurama. That, that I kept thinking of that Futurama episode. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we come to the third day since the invasion. Uh, and we are told by midnight the human race would cease to exist. Then we get the scene in this movie. The most unbelievable scene I have ever seen in a movie. Uh, everything in this movie makes complete sense except for this scene. <laughs> How the fuck is John beating Jay's ass? John is a bitch, and Jay is a fucking major in the military. And Jay is getting, like, fucking knocked to the ground with one punch constantly. Well, this was after he fought the alien, right? Yeah, well, and this is also because John, at the time, was played by an actor who was more popular. Although, John Agar, the guy playing Jay, is much more popular these days. It just, it's just unbelievable. Like, I'll believe everything in this movie except for this. Yeah, like, I would have I would have believed that if he, like, grabbed something and hit him in the head with a wrench and got the upper hand that way to yeah. just kind of throw him on his ass. But this is just the case of them trying to show that, you know, a, a you know, the good guy can prevail with his uh, sense of what's right and wrong over the military man who just wants to get the job done and doesn't care how. Yeah, but John's being a little selfish bitch. He's like, oh, well, we obviously can't win. We need to take the deal that the alien gave us that he'll spare our lives uh, if we let him go. And it's like, why do you why do you honestly believe he would spare your life? He's literally said they're going to kill everyone. They're not going to leave us alive to even use us as cattle. John is an idiot for a fucking scientist. Well, they're also trying to make him the weak, rational-minded person that's going to double-cross it's just an excuse to have him do what he's doing here. And it's just kind of weak and lazy writing. I, I do admit that. And it did, it does always bother me as well, but it it ends quickly enough to where I didn't get as fixated on it as what you do. It was just unbelievable. I don't know. I just didn't yeah. get it. So yeah, John you're right. throws it's something. bad writing. It totally is Jerry. <laughs> yeah. So John throws shit at the wall and sets off the alarms and sparks. And it seems to affect the zombie. It turns out sound is the answer. We need sonic rays. Cause no matter what, it still has to be a ray. Coincidentally, the sound of my voice is all you need to defeat these actual aliens. So just listen to my podcast, cinema psyops and you're safe. 
Fun fact, in the remake of Mars Attacks that will come out in 2020, we actually beat the aliens by making them listen to Cinema Psyops. <laughs> yeah, we're going to retcon that from Slim... What is it? Slim... Or do I... Or which was Slim... Oh, the Yoakum or whatever, whatever Yodel guy. I can't remember. Yeah, the Yodel now. guy. I... <laughs> yeah. We are going to make them listen to them talk about like humanoids of the deep. <laughs> yes. Because that will kill any alien. And then ever. when they start getting a resistance to that, we go, we hit them with Matt whining about fucking Last House on the left. <laughs> and if they develop a resistance to that, we'll just play the Romero series and then it's all over for everyone. Nah, well, I mean, the Romero series wasn't that bad. <laughs> I guess you'll play them everything after like Day of the Dead. Like you'll hit them with like the, the like survival and uh, my personal favorite uh, Library of the Dead. Uh, so yeah, this mini explosion explosion uh, shorted out the breakers, causing the air conditioner and the filtering system to turn off. Uh, so now they have about an hour and a half of air before they will have to open the vents because they got to get this movie over with. We're coming up on like fifty minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're so they make out of a, time. <laughs> yeah, so they make a sound gun, and they shove that in, in in a hole and use that, and it kills a fucking alien. And we get our first look at the alien. It looks like a ghost mummy of the creature of the Black Lagoon, um, but it is actually a recycled suit from It, the Terror from Beyond Space. They just put some effects on it to make yeah. it look white. Didn't they solarize it to make it just be a negative to the opposite of what it would normally look like? Yes, pretty much, which is why at first I'm like... Oh, it's like a ghost or a mummy or a creature in the black. What the fuck is this? Yeah. Um, we should we should grab a still of the the creature from the movie that we're watching here and then get the one from it that you're talking about so you can actually see what the suits look like regular and then in photo negative like they did for this movie. Oh, well, yeah, I Googled it. I, I looked at it. Um, and yeah, you can tell it is it just fucking white. It's. They just blurred it out with a bunch of fucking whiteness, like as if I had had shown my fucking ankles and brightness <laughs> in my white skin fucking affected the film. Um That's a barrage of imagery. Yeah, so they they get in a van and uh Jay gets all fucking sniper style on the top of it, and they ride around killing zombies until they find the spaceship. And, uh, but Jay, unfortunately, our, our, our hero takes a fucking bullet because in this one, zombies got guns. Where the fuck you at, Romero? Zombies got guns. You ain't got guns. This is Grand Theft Auto, bitch. Uh, Bub carried a gun and shot it quite well. Suck a dick. Uh, (laughs) also, uh, Big Daddy not only figured out how to shoot guns, he also taught other zombies how to shoot guns. Okay, you have a valid point. Um... (laughs) <laughs> so I've got nothing to say back to you. Uh, this is like the fifth time you've uh, corrected what I've said. Uh, I'm regretting this decision to have you on because I no longer feel as smart as I normally do. Um, so, uh, yeah, they tracked the spaceship by blocking the bro- – because the spaceship was blocking the broadcast. So they're going to use the jamming signal so that they can track it. And that's how they get in the van. And then uh, Jay – uh, shoots him with a gun, but then Jay gets shot by a gun. Much like how we see in the Romero movies later on. Uh, I definitely am not editing out shit Court previously said to inform me. Um, maybe me saying something wrong. That obviously did not happen um, at all. Uh, whew, um, uh, warning! Do not watch this movie with headphones on uh, because the sound of the gun is just a basically... Horrible screech. It is, uh... <laughs> I was really waiting for Jay to just hold up the gun and go, this is my screech stick. Also, anytime he's about to fire that, turn down your surround sound. Otherwise, it will also damage your hearing and send your cats sailing across the room away from it. Oh, dude, my cats were pissed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were not happy about that. This movie is not cat-friendly. Not at all. Whatever those frequencies oh, are, your God. felines hate it. Uh, yeah, so... Jay ends up surviving the gunshot and he shoots the ship and blows it the fuck up, uh, which allows, uh, Dr. Uh, fucking guy who has not been important for a while now, uh, Pinner, uh, to fucking tell everyone how to defeat this. Then we jump to them at the United Nations where, uh, they learn they could fight together for a common cause and they all get awards. Even John the bitch. 
<laughs> and that's this movie. That's how fun this fucking movie. I would actually, I will actually say this for a low budget film, being that it's an hour and seven minutes long. I had fun with it. I actually really enjoyed it. I had fun with it. It really was never really boring. It kind of had a good pacing of it where it kept going. I really liked the zombie aspect. I really liked the stock footage narration combo. Uh, while we have definitely pointed out flaws in the movie, I will say this is actually a, a pretty fun watch. Court, what are your final thoughts on it? Yeah, I actually completely agree with you on that. It's a lot of these types of films from this era are really hit and miss, and a lot of times they more miss than hit. But all of the points that are enjoyable in this film and all of the crazy, wacky weirdness, this one is way different than a lot of other ones. I mean, the reanimated dead where the aliens slip in and just, you know, basically move us around like meat puppets. Very cool, very creepy stuff. And the sequence where John Carradine is talking to Adam Penner and just telling him and laying out everything that's going to happen... Carradine's performance alone is worth sitting through the rest of this film just for that opening sequence. I mean, that's what roped me in the first time I watched it. And that's the thing I always remember when I think about. So I absolutely really enjoy watching this film. It's a total blast. And I recommend the Kino Lorber Blu-ray of it. The print is incredible. And the zombie-ish makeup on the dead looks awesome. Yeah, I am a big fan. Uh, I know a lot of people were like, why are you buying black and white movies on Blu-ray? Because they look fucking amazing. Like, you, any of the Universal Classic Monster movies on Blu-ray, they look fucking spotless. They are so fucking... I love black and white movies on Blu-ray. Uh, like, the uh, the old black house on Blu-ray. Oh my god, it's fucking wonderful. Um, there are some movies that don't come out looking quite as good, but they still look really good. Like, I was slightly disappointed with the uh the black cat on the scream factory release they just did in universal classics um because i was hoping it'd be a little bit better but that's because scream factory did not do the restoration someone else did and they just reused that one so i yeah. thought that was kind of shitty uh anything the other the kino lorber amazing. anything the kino lorber releases black and white movies wise or just anything in general they always do some type of remastering and fix it up they spend the money on that so yeah. some of their some of their releases may feel like they're more bare bones, but that's because they treat the movie with kit gloves, and that's why their stuff turns out as good as it does. Unfortunately, yeah. you don't get that with a lot of those types of things, so it's always good to do a little research on whether or not a Blu-ray is worth your while. And sometimes you need to import it from overseas because they will spend more time restoring the film, and you're going to get more out of it that way. Yeah, except for Kino's release of Cabin Boy. I know that's not a black and white movie, but that transfer was not... As good as I was hoping it would be, Kino. Uh, I wonder new... if the elements themselves weren't stored that great, because that might have been something that the way that the movie itself wasn't preserved, it might not have been their fault. Oh, no, like, the, probably not, because the commentary is literally like Chris Elliott and the director talking about how fucking shitty the movie is. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the people that were behind the film gave it less love than the actual Kino Lorber release. They did what they could. So, tangent, but uh, basically the movie was supposed to be directed by Tim Burton. And Tim Burton, at last minute, was like, nope, I'm going to go direct Ed Wood instead. So, uh, you wrote it, you direct it, and I'll back it. And so, the guy was like a first-time director, and he directed it, and that's kind of what happened. But I love Cabin Boy. Uh, it is in, it's one of the greatest uh, comedies of the 90s. You pair it up with, with uh, uh captain ron and you're gonna have a good time but more importantly darren how did you feel about this movie i had a lot of fun with it and yeah it's only an hour and change so, seven minutes yeah hour and seven minutes i can have sex 47 times during that <laughs> i would need at least three sandwiches try and do half that uh yeah uh this is one I definitely will say. I think we all recommend it. Um, I'm not into movie ratings. I believe a recommendation is all you need to rate a movie. And I would definitely say, watch this shit. It's on Amazon Prime. If you don't want to buy the uh, Kino Blu-ray, it's on Amazon Prime. I kind of want to get the Kino because I want to hear the commentary track because I, 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 I'm just fucking super nerdy about that shit. Uh, but this was fun. Uh, so glad for everyone to join us on our first episode of the atomic age sauce cast we have no idea uh how often this podcast is going to come out or you know how formats might change and how we're going to do it this is kind of the 
pilot episode, but I had a lot of fucking fun with it. And uh, we will continue going through movies. We will bounce from, you know, the atomic age creature features that are through here, like them, or even like um, a lot of the Harryhausen uh, movies that came out that deal with either monsters or flying saucers. Pretty much, if the movie has some kind of form that connects to uh, our fear of nuclear weapons and fallout and radiation or the fear of invasion of communism, then it's probably going to end up on this show. It is it is pretty eligible, so we will be tackling all kind of stuff. I don't know what movies we're going to tackle next, but I know one I would love to tackle is Them, which is one of the greatest, like, one of the greatest monster movies of this era. Um, so then would be fun. I know Court was talking about the Black Scorpion. Yeah, would be both a lot of those. Of um, either either of those two are great examples of what we're talking about here. So whichever one is next, I'm totally fine with. Yeah, and then we also have great ones like uh, you know we have the amazing War of the Worlds. We have uh, fucking uh, Invaders from Mars. Uh, both of those are just fucking amazing for the time. Yeah. And when's when's the original thing from? Isn't that uh, the that original be... thing? Is this time frame? Yeah. yeah. Yes, it is. It is 1980 or 81. Um, <laughs> no, no, not John Carpenter. Not the best thing. The thing from another Just... world. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. Uh, Howard Hawks in 19. Uh, yeah, no, it was it was 1950, uh, 50 or 51 was the Howard Hawks uh, version of it. And uh, yeah, I would love to do that one also. I'm, I'm a big fan of that one. That fucking. Oh man, that fucking scene where they light them on fire. Yeah. Like, and yeah. like the whole room is kind of dark, and then all of a sudden it just lights up by this fire. The whole fucking scene's lit by fire. It's, oh. Yeah, that God. burn walk is amazing. I can't believe they were able to do that in the time frame that they did that, and in the safety equipment that they had. It that dude was in so much danger the whole time he was walking like that on fire. Yes. Oh my God. That. Oh, I love that movie. So, and and if you guys have movies you want us to cover. Definitely let us know. Uh, we would be glad to fucking cover them. So I guess now it's time to... Uh, we're going to pimp some wares. So uh, if you liked us on this, you can find us in other places. Uh, Court, where can they find you? Easiest place to go, legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. If you're listening to this on the main Legion feed, you've already found a place to find us because we're there. We're also in pretty much anywhere podcast can be found for you to get your hands on for free stitcher uh apple podcasts you know google play that kind of stuff uh even spotify now i guess we're there too so everywhere yes and anywhere that's the you easiest can, place to find me is legionpodcast.com though forward slash cinema dash psyops you can also order floppy disk from russia because that's how they listen to it over there yes i have to ship floppy disks over into russia yeah um, that joke didn't really work, but I thought it was funny in my head. But when they play um, it out of those computers, they run them through tube amps and we sound so much better. <laughs> well, yeah, it disguises your voice. <laughs> well, it adds additional harmonics, but we won't go into that. <laughs> um, yeah. And you know, uh, there's also a fantastic Facebook group for cinema psyops that I highly recommend joining as, uh, not only between, like, the PSYOPs news articles that get posted, but uh, great Photoshop, especially stuff Darren does. Yeah, um, our group would not be the same without the likes of Darren and Chris and a lot of other folks that do our alternative photography. Yeah, it's really, really good stuff. Um, what episodes have you had come out recently? The most recent ones, as of this recording, we've started in on our listener-supported series where an actual listener uh, purchased... Four discs and I think five total movies for us to cover. And a bulk of those are pornographic films of the heyday era of porn, like very early 70s. Um, we so are you talking about like Debbie Does Dallas or Behind the Green Door? Yeah, around that era, but different movies. The one that we just recently did um, that has been released uh, is A Woman's Torment with, with Roberta Finlay's film. And then when the one before that that we did... Um, geez, why can't I even think of the name off the top of my head? Um, that shows you the impression that that film left with me. Uh, <laughs> memories. I want to make sure I get this right. Memories within Miss Aggie. And uh, mm. both of those have a very weird psychological bent to them that the listener, Robert, who did this support for us, 
wanted to hear us talk about because he knew that we would not just go, huh, it's going in and out. You know, <laughs> we would actually examine the plot line of it. So they're like legit the hardcore porn. It's not like softcore stuff. Oh, no. These films are legit hardcore. There's okay, actual like, full on penetration in them. Okay. I didn't know if like, cause I thought it would be, I think it would be funny if like someone started covering like the, the uh, Roman porno and pinky films from Japan. Funny you should say that. We're going to be doing some Andy Sedaris films shortly and some other of that softcore kind of stuff that would have shown up on USA Up all night, half like heavily edited. And Cinema Diabolica did do some of the Roman and Pinky stuff as well, and we may cover that someday. Um, I don't have any of it currently, but who knows? It may end up in the collection one day. Nice. All right. Darren, pimp your wares. Tell us uh, where we can find you before the government black mask you and <laughs> yes. hide you in Siberia or some shit. Yeah. Turns before, you into beef for Vendetta. Before the black helicopters show up, uh, the Psycho Semantic podcast can be found in all the places that Court mentioned before. Uh, just search Psycho Semantic on Google or Spotify or iTunes or wherever you like. Um, I am also. Being the drummer that I am, I'm in a lot of bands. Uh, I'm also in the VD Clinic podcast, found in all the same places. Uh, and then uh, oh, search VD Clinic Pod if you're looking on you know, uh, Twitter, Instagram. For the psychosemantic, somebody's squatting on that name and doing shit with it. So <laughs> Twitter, the Twitter handle on that is at political movies you know, because you know we do politics, movies, and political movies over there. Uh, most recently, Jerry, you and I talked about the Franklin Credit Union cover-up in Nebraska and uh, Epstein. And coming up should be a joint effort between Psychosemantic and the VD Clinic pod covering the end of season three of The Handmaid's Tale. And in September at the VD Clinic, we are also doing... Women in Cages and the Big Bird Cage, continuing uh, our... Uh, yeah. I <laughs> love the Big Bird Cage. I legit have a VHS copy of it signed by Sid Haig. Oh, oh nice. That's awesome. I just have the DVD and Blu-ray. <laughs> I've got I've got the Blu-ray of the Women in Cages stuff, but yeah, I when I knew I was meeting Sid Haig, everyone was like, oh, what are you getting signed? House of a Thousand Corpses? And I was like, bitch, no. Okay, <laughs> the Big Bird Cage, in case you didn't know. Yeah, I would definitely get his Roger Corman output signed and want to talk to him about that. But also uh, any of the stuff he did with Jack Hill, which is partly the Roger Corman stuff, too. But Spider Baby, I would love to ask a ton of oh, questions yeah. about with him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. And also, if warning, if you listen to uh, the episode I just did on Psychosemantic Podcast with Darren, uh, graphic content warning. It deals with a lot of... And I mean a lot of fucked up stuff. So, you know, if you want nightmares, go right ahead. Oh, and I'm also on what was used to be called the Midnight Horror Show, but right now it's being called the Movie and Hip Hop Show, so we can keep the same initials. Uh, I think because we've been uh, debating the best uh, albums by members of the Wu-Tang Clan. But uh, that that is with, you know, Duncan McLeish, who we've mentioned before, Fancy Pants Mark, and, you know, Danny Trioxin and a couple other people that you will have heard on the Psychosemantic podcast. Most of those nice. folks can also be heard on my show. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we're all some big group fuck. It's like a big you know? music scene, man. Play shows yeah. together. It's, it's a community where we're more Except commune I, than unity. I have never been on uh, Cinema PsyOps. I am banned from Cinema PsyOps uh, because I'm too sexy. Uh, no, that's not the case. It was that the equipment was causing issues for us to be able to bring another person into Skype. And, because I'm too sexy. And also because Jerry's too sexy and he burned out the equipment <laughs> when we tried to have him on. Uh, I pop capacitors, you know what I'm saying? Like, I can't help it. It's just what I fucking do. Well, I'm uh, putting bigger capacitors on my equipment to be able to handle Jerry's sexiness <laughs> and its capacitance. Uh, yeah, uh, and as for me, I do Kill the Cast. Our most recent episode was uh, Horror Coliseum for the worst Jaws sequel. Jaws 3D versus Jaws of Revenge, where uh, the phrase Jaws of Revenge is hereditary with a shark is said. Um, <laughs> uh, in fact, I say it and I stand by it. Um, I am tired of the naysayers about Jaws of Revenge. 
I explain why this movie is fantastic, and you will all probably just laugh at me and tell me I'm wrong. And uh, you know what? That's what you get for not being as sexy as me, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and also uh, having equipment that can't handle how sexy you are. Exactly. I originally was going to do this on Cinema PsyOps, and he was just like, we can't handle you and water-free Michael Caine. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's that's understandable, Court. I will uh, just do it on my show. Um then we've also got Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, which our next episode records uh, a week from today. So uh, you'll hear it relatively within a week after you hear this, where we are covering Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster, a uh, classic of the franchise, I guess. Uh, classic in the sense it was on Mystery Science Theater 3000. That's what matters. And uh, you will also hear shortly another... A uh, new pilot show called Cult Unknown with me and uh, Mr. Venom, a.k.a. Jerry Cortez, where we will be talking Bigfoot. Ooh. Oh, yeah, it's super sexy time. Um, and is that all I do right now? I think that's all I do right now besides uh, this wonderful thing. Um, <laughs> so with that being said, you can, of course, find us by Googling Kill the Cast everywhere. Uh, much like the other two, we are a proud member of Legion Podcast. Uh, you can find uh, many more podcasts that I will list by name after this recording is done uh, on this little beautiful bumper we have. So check out other shows on the Legion Podcast Network. Let us know what you want us to cover on this show. Uh, obviously, check out Court and Darren's shows. Uh, both are uh, much better than my own because I am not on them. Um, You're on mine. Sense, right? Oh, yeah, well, Darren's show is not as good as Court's show because I'm on Dar- I've been on Darren's shows twice, and we already have a third uh, one planned. So, uh, <laughs> uh, which will be all about Satanism. Woohoo. Fucking uh, right. I, I fucking, I spoiled it right here, but that's all you get is that it's just about Satanism. Um. I think that's all I've got. Any, any parting words for the people, Court? Just because they're invisible doesn't mean they're invaders. Unless they're... Uh... Oh, Major J. He can invade me. <laughs> Wait, no, that's not American. Uh, Darren, you got any parting words? <laughs> I I can't top that. That's, okay, that's well, also uh, very much not American. But uh, Well, in the words of uh, this error... We would like to say, keep watching the skies. Hey, there we go. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. The Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.